This video is supported by EmuDB, the lightweight, high-speed immutable database for systems and applications. Tape devices, tape reels were central to the first 50 or 60 years of computing as we know it. It was just impossible to process the large amounts of data that we had to process in those days without involving magnetic tape. Only later on, disks started to take over the role of tape devices. Welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. In the previous video, we looked at disk devices uh, through the history of the IBM S360 family of mainframes all the way to modern times. And we saw the um, unbelievable evolution of disk drives, densities, speeds, uh, and capacities, as well as size uh, through the first uh, 50 or six, 55 years of the mainframe. Today, we're gonna look at the same questions, but from a point of view of tape devices. We all know that, you know, we've all seen all these videos of data centers with dozens of tape uh, drives with reels spinning, um, those uh, vacuum locking windows going up and down. And today we're gonna look in more detail what those tape drives were and how they evolved over time. So the tape uh, was invented actually way before the mainframe happened. Uh, IBM invented the uh, the tape device in the 30s, 1930s, as a means to store analog data such as uh, such as uh, voice and other uh, seismic data and other uh, analog data. And then in the 50s, IBM perfected the tape drive as we know it, and started to use tape devices to store digital data, especially with vacuum tape uh, drives. And so the vacuum tape drive is something that IBM invented. I, the IBM 705 mainframe, which is, as I said in the previous video, more geared towards accounting and business records processing, had a tape drive from the beginning, and it was called the 726 tape drive. So you can see here, this is a picture of the IBM 726 tape drive. It's, it's so ancient, it almost looks futuristic to me. Um, these are two tape drives here with each um, a capable of each to load two reels. It was announced in 1952 and the density back then was 1,400 bits per square inch. So if you imagine a square inch with your fingers and then fitting 1,400 bits in there, it's already, it's already uh, respectable. The transfer rate was, uh, was just a very modest 6.1 kilobytes per second. That was as much data as, as the mainframe could push through to the tape drives at any second. The capacity for the 726 model was 2.3 megabytes. Later on, densities were improved on the 727 model to 4.7, uh, 4.6 megabytes. Then in, in 1970, IBM announced the very famous, the iconic 3420 tape drive of which there were several models with this custody model 3, 5, and 7. It was announced in 1970. It needed the IBM 3803 controller. And remember that mainframe doesn't talk directly to devices. It talks through an I.O. computer called a channel to a controller. And then the controller uh, is the one that knows how to electrically and electronically and logically access the devices that it controls. So an IBM 3803 could control up to eight units, eight tape drives. The density at the beginning was 800 bits per inch. It increased then to double 1600. The transfer rate was already much improved from just 20 years before, uh, 120 kilobytes uh, per second with the first ones and later ones, uh, 160 kilobytes per second. The capacity on a reel, on a standard reel, was 42 megabytes. And that's the size I still rem remember well because it was kind of a size you had to deal with when you worked in a data center. You knew that at most you could fit 42 megabytes on a reel. Later, IBM released four, models 4, 6, and 8. They were announced just a year later uh, over time. And the density was 6,250 bits per inch, which became the industry standard. Uh, almost every other manufacturer of tape drives eventually uh, started to make uh, tape, tape drives with this um, bits per inch density, which is important if you want to have, if you want to exchange tapes from one computing architecture, let's say from a VMS computer to an IBM mainframe. The transfer rate here was uh, improved again substantially to 1.25 megabytes per second. And these are the tape drives that I work most with uh, 
in the mid 80s. Some of those were kept in service until 2012, I just learned last week at a government facility. And the capacity was 150 megabytes, which is also a size that most people remember that this is the largest single data set that you could back up um, as a data set um, without involving an application program onto a tape drive. We uh, are users of MBS 3.8 TK4, update eight, which is the current update, but soon we'll have update nine. We use uh, this device, this exact model here, on address 480. We have only one tape uh, drive defined, and it makes sense. Some people can ask me why we only have four, one tape drive on, on TK4, and that is because even back in those days, there used to be tape operators, and the more tape uh, devices you have, and the more traffic there is, the more people are gonna run around with tape reels. And so, since most users are single user users of MBS TK4, meaning that there very few people have multiple users logging in and out and running jobs, one tape uh, machine, one tape uh, device is usually enough to process everything we need to process. And it's easy to add more. But this is important to remember. In MBS 3.8, we really just all became single user um, uh, accounts for, and for, for this uh, amazing operating system. And whereas in real mainframes out there in data centers back then and still today, they used to be, well, maybe today less, but back then they used to be tape operators. They used, they used to be whole tape rooms adjacent uh, to, the, to the data center where two, three, four, five tape operators were working in shifts. Whenever the operating system MBS needed the tape, it would print it on the console. There used to be a tape console and then people would go find the tape and mount it and press the load button. And so it used to be a job, which later on was taken over by tape robots. Uh, Storage Tech was one of the innovators in this area, and eventually everybody else started to make tape robots. This is a picture, a typical picture, and something I remember very, very well. This would be very familiar for me in the 80s. Thousands of tape reels mounted this way, and there would be serial numbers attached to them. Those would be the volume numbers, the serial volume of the tape, so that when the operating system was requesting, uh, let's say 15078, uh, they were ordered here in some order, then the tape operator would come here, take it off, take the, take the plastic, the, that, as you can see here, that's, that protects the tape drive, the tape, uh, the magnetic tape inside, load it on the machine, We'll press the button, the window will come down, load the machine, the window will come up, a vacuum will be formed inside, and then uh, press load, and the operating system will start to process it. And the tape console will tell you on which device to load the tape. So you couldn't just pick one. You had to go put it on the device that MBS was, ex was expecting to uh, see the tape at. Later on, in 1984, IBM announced the 3480 uh, tape cartridge. I remember those days very well. Uh, we were like, it came as a complete surprise that after we had seen this for so many years and the size of it, we could go now to something that was so small and very protected so that the tape inside, the, the, the magnetic media inside wouldn't get, um, wouldn't deteriorate over time due to uh, air and dirt going in. And so we were all stunned when we saw this uh, announcement. And and so we, we, we I remember those days very well. And you could still put in here, you can see here the numbering um, on the side so you could find those tapes again. So uh, this increased reliability, of course, of the media. And you could have stacker. So you could have a little thing that you will mount on top of the, we'll see the picture soon, of the tape drive that would, you could put in, I think, seven or eight tapes, and the operating system would just, the tape drive would just load the next one when it needed a new scratch tape. Um, so it solved to a large extent the library physical size. So if you look at this, and now you imagine you put it on media, there is maybe, you know, you go from this to this, and they're much easier to stack because they're, they have a shape that's easier to stack on top of each other. Uh, then you know, you solved something, right? And uh, that's why everybody was excited. And the switch from 3420 to 3480 happened very fast, but almost every data center kept one or two or three 
tape drives around for two reasons. One is because it took time to transfer everything from these reels to these cartridges. So you needed to be able to read them in and read them out. Second, a lot of uh, data exchange, let's say from the central banks to the banks, from the authorities to the companies, um, all the data exchange for a long time after the cartridges were introduced still happened with 3420 and only gradually um, that data interchange uh, moved to cartridges. So almost every data center was forced to keep a 3420 or a bunch of 3420 for, uh, for those purposes. And since 3420 had a lot of moving parts, there was, uh, there's a, if you look inside one, it's very arcane technology and it, it wears out because there's so much force applied to uh, inside those machines. Uh, there was always one or two being serviced by IBM uh, service. So the transfer rate went from 1.25 to three megabytes per second and the capacity increased substantially also to 200 megabytes. So we thought that's it, we've solved the problem of tapes. But then, um, in 1989, IBM uh, did it again and in made everything better again. It announced the 3490 tape drive, and you see here the stacker, where you could stack several tapes. This, each one of those is a tape, is a tape cartridge. And here's the display that tells you what what it's doing and which which tape it's looking at right now. And the transfer rate went from three megabytes to 4.5 megabytes per second as the capacity went up. And obviously it does have to increase as you have more stuff on those cartridges, you need to also improve the transfer rate or you would just start to linearly wait more and more time as you improve, as you, um, improve the capacity on those cartridges. Then after that, IBM announced the IBM 3590 tape um, unit device it now had the 90, uh, sorry, nine megabytes per second transfer rate and the full 10 gigabytes of capacity per cartridge. And again, people thought that's it. We've solved the, the storage problem uh, and the uh, archival backup problem once and for all. Little did we know that storage was, and storage demand and storage capacity was just about to explode with the digital age and the internet and the, no, the, the amount of data needed to be backed up and stored on tape was only starting to, uh, to take off. Then in 2000, and this is just, there were many other tape drives that IBM announced in between. IBM is kind of the leader in magnetic archival and magnetic uh, backup. Um, IBM has a subsidiary in Europe and Switzerland that is worldwide the leader in research and they, in, they continue to increase uh, the capacity of those drives every year. And so tapes are still important for backing up um, data that you need to carry to another place. So if you have, if you're a bank, you need to back up every day all your, you know, your customers' accounts, all your ledgers, and then you need to move them to a safe location. Tapes are really the only way to do it. You're gonna, you're not gonna double disk uh, capacity to another location and then be able to, in and overnight to transfer all the data, all the databases through a an internet link. Uh, and once you exceed a certain amount of data, the cheapest way to transfer data and the fastest way to transfer data, both cheapest and fastest, becomes tape. Because uh, you know you can't have a link fast enough to, um, to transfer this amount of data uh, as efficiently and as quickly. So tape will continue to be around for a long time for business purposes, for archival and regulatory purposes. And so this is just an example of one tape drive announced recently by IBM 2017, 6.4 gigabyte, that's gigabytes per square inch. So we went, if you look um, all the way up when we started, 1,400 bit per square inch and 6.1 kilobyte transfer rate, 2.3 megabytes of storage capacity. And now we go to 2017 6.4 gigabytes per square inch, 91 megabytes per second transfer rate, and 2.5 AP bytes. That's 2.5 times 10 to the power of 18 capacity on one media. That's kind of the, what we're looking at. Now, tape labels is something very important when you're dealing with tapes. There is a format, an IBM called IBM Standard Label, which applies to what is at the beginning of each tape media, reel, or cartridge, and how is this organized. So there, you can have unlabeled tapes or you can have labeled tapes. Um, most, uh, most environments use uh, standard labeled uh, tapes. 
So you have a label here, then you have a header, that's a tape mark, and then you take a data set, and then usually the application writes another tape mark to, to indicate the, the end of one logical uh, data on this data item on this tape. And then you could have another uh, standard label. Um, the, the, sorry, then they have the trailer and tape mark, tape mark means this is the end. Two tape marks means it's the end of the tape. Whereas this unlabeled tapes have just the data set and two tape marks at the end to indicate that there's no more data coming uh, at the end of this media. So this is the way that labels are being written on every uh, tape media. And we can see here the capacities. We had the similar table for the uh, DASTI or the disk devices for the for the mainframe disks, and um, um, so I thought it would be nice to have something similar for the tape. So you can see here the years it was available, the media type, the capacity, the transfer rate, and the length of those reels. So you can see we went from uh, on the 3420 to 42 megabytes to 150, 200, 400, 800, 20, and then later now 2017 we have, as we saw, 2.5 AP byte per media. Transfer rates went up amazingly too, from 60 kilobytes per second all the way as we saw here, six, uh, 91 megabytes per second. And this is the length of those reels. So as you can see, there was quite an amazing development in the density, meaning that in the sensitivity of the electronics that can write and read to tape. And of course, this, you know, this means that the magnetic media itself, the material on which uh, data is being written, had to evolve too. You couldn't use just the same kind of ferrite um, magnetic material that you had on those uh, tapes 40 years ago and think that you could write uh, this kind of density, 6.4 gigabytes per square inch on, on, those, on that kind of media. No, you needed to go and do fundamental materials research. And so there's only one company worldwide that has the, the amount of people, the amount of research centers, the Nobel Prize winners, the fundamental materials research, the fundamental electronic research to be able to produce this kind of uh, leading and amazing, uh, amazing devices, and that's IBM. And so uh, that's why IBM is who IBM is. And uh, for me, the tape, uh, the evolution tape capacity and tape drives is where I see most the evolution that we went through over the last 55, uh, 57 years of the mainframe. It's just unbelievable how much we have improved over over this it's and it's been said many times before it's the equivalent of uh, having one drop of fuel and drive a uh, uh, hundred thousand miles in a car with it that's the kind of um, innovation that's the kind of improvement we've seen from ibm and other uh, tape vendors and to a similar extent although not quite as dramatic also for disk devices as well and memory of course too and, and many other aspects so this is uh, what a, what's important to understand when we when it comes to uh, to tape devices. We started uh, on the S360 with the 3420. There were several models of it. They improved all. We used the 3420 in MBS TK4, and uh, the job of top up the tape operator has disappeared because it was taken over by software, by console up uh, automation as well as by tape robots. And, um, and also, by the way, the printer operator has disappeared. And I think mostly, I mean, for except for the very largest data centers, the operator role, the console operator has disappeared too. So even in IT, we automate jobs away, of course. And then the, the amazing evolution from round reels to the cartridges, etc. So this gives you a feeling of uh, what we have uh, in tape devices on the mainframe. And then in the next installment of this mini series, we'll look at unit recording devices such as uh, punch, reader, um, and, uh, and terminals, 3270 terminals, as well as some specialty devices um, that also existed, sometimes for a short time only, sometimes for a longer time on the mainframe, such as, uh, for instance, as, uh, as uh, special CPUs, and, um, and uh, vector processing units and stuff like that. So if you have any questions about the tape devices, how they're used, uh, how they work, then please um, 
post a comment below this video. If you want to join an amazing community of other mainframe enthusiasts around the world, hobbyists that like the mainframe, want to learn or want to share their experience, there is uh, in the description below this video a link to the Discord channel where this community is hosted and uh, with, with very lively discussions. I, I advise you to join if you want to have uh, like-minded people uh, in one place and uh, please press on the thumbs up button if you like this video and consider subscribing if you haven't subscribed to the Washington's mainframe channel yet. Thank you very much and goodbye.